I will call the Committee on Judiciary to order. Will the Secretary please take the roll? Senator Harris. Here. Senator Orenshaw. Senator Dondero Loop. Here. Senator Wynn. Here. Senator Hansen. Here. Senator Krasner. Here. Senator Stone. Here. Chair Scheibel. Here. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. We have one bill hearing on the agenda. It is SB 153, which I will be presenting. So I'm going to hand the gavel over to Vice Chair Harris right now, and um, the meeting is yours. Thank you so much, Chair Scheibel. We'll go ahead and open the hearing for Senate Bill 153 and welcome our chair uh, to the table. All right, Chair Scheibel, um, go ahead and start whenever you're ready. I believe you have a couple of joint presenters with you. I believe we have Mr. Richard Sens, who is an attorney at Lambda Legal via Zoom. There he is. Hello, sir. Welcome. Uh, and we have the lovely, incomparable Cy Burnaby, who is the executive director at Gender Justice. Welcome to the committee. Chair Scheibel. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chair Harris. Uh, my name is Melanie Scheibel, and I am the state senator for District 9. Um, it's my pleasure to be introducing SB 153 and presenting it to you this afternoon. This is modeled on a bill that I previously brought in the 2021 session that uh, passed, I believe, through this committee, but not through the Finance Committee. To give you kind of a brief roadmap of what we'll be talking about today, um, like Vice Chair Harris mentioned, um, I I'm the, the bill sponsor, and I'm lucky to be joined by by two subject matter experts. Um, Cy Bernabe is the Executive Director of Gender Justice in Nevada, and they will be uh, presenting after me to provide some better commentary on the living conditions for people who are incarcerated who are trans and gender nonconforming or gender non-binary. And then we also have uh, Richard Sens with us from Lambda Legal. Lambda Legal is a national civil rights organization, and he will be able to answer some of the more, the finer points on the legal questions involved in uh, this piece of legislation. Um, with that said, let me give you some, some background and um, kind of an overview of the bill. The bill requires regulations uh, prescribing standards for the supervision, custody, care, security, housing, and medical and mental health treatment for offenders who are transgender, gender nonconforming, gender nonbinary, and intersex within the, within the Nevada Department of Corrections. As all of you on the committee know, the Nevada Department of Corrections oversees the prisons in Nevada, so those would be people who are serving sentences on felony cases of a year or more. Uh, the bill also requires that the director, meaning the, the director of the Department of uh, corrections, add training and cultural competency regarding how to interact with members of the population to the existing list of training and courses that are provided to staff at each of the institutions and facilities run by the Nevada Department of Corrections. Before I go through the specifics of the bill, I think it's important to explain why we need this legislation. Uh, it should come as no surprise that offenders who are members of any of the vulnerable populations addressed by 153 are vulnerable both in the correction systems just as they are in everyday society. Transgender, other gender nonconforming people, intersex folks all deserve the same rights, respects, care, and opportunities of people who fit more comfortably into gender categories. This legislature has been working on similar efforts for a while now to ensure that wherever people are in the state of Nevada and however they identify their gender identity, their sexual orientation um, is respected and that they're treated with dignity. One place we still have some work to do is within the Nevada Department of Corrections. Within the broad requirement that the Nevada Department of Corrections has to create regulations governing the custody and care of offenders, we have unfortunately seen that there is a population, there are many populations, but one of them that has been left behind are transgender, gender nonconforming, and gender nonbinary folks. Um, I, I think this is a good time to recognize, as you've probably heard a couple of times during this session, that um, I've been working with a 
group of very committed advocates on this legislation for several years now. And uh, this group, some of whom are, are behind me and, and with me today, I think um, would agree that we are very thankful to be working with Director Zarenda uh, going into this session and working to create uh, more comprehensive policies that allow for the Department of Corrections to function in a way that is respectful and, um, and fair for everybody. And so when I say that we have seen that there are problems with the Nevada Department of Corrections, I want to be clear that um, we, we see the Department of Corrections as a partner in solving this problem. Um, and that's why the legislation doesn't spell out regulations, but calls on the Department of Corrections to develop these regulations. Because over the course of the next hour or so, uh, you'll hear testimony essentially from people who are incarcerated and identify as trans, non-binary, or um, intersex about their experiences in the Department of Corrections. Uh, we have had numerous incarcerated people reach out to us, I say broadly, meaning uh, you know, direct leaders within this space, leaders of those organizations like Gender Justice Nevada and Return Strong, um, people who are incarcerated have reached out to them and reached out to me to share their stories. And so uh, some of our partners who are not incarcerated will be reading directly from letters that they have sent or phone calls that we have had with those incarcerated people. Um, so I also want to mention that the Nevada Department of Corrections is also tasked with complying with the Federal Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, also known as PREA, and that is vitally important to protecting offenders. However, the regulations prescribed in PREA are not enough to capture all of the unique challenges that gender non-binary and gender non-conforming folks face when they are in a correctional setting. So the goal of SB 153 is to make clear in statute our commitment to, to protecting the same rights and protections of all offenders and to require that our correctional system carry out that commitment. So I'm going to go over the, the sections of 153 very briefly. It's not a long bill. Sections 2 through 5 set forth the definitions of gender non-binary, gender non-conforming, intersex, and transgender for the purposes of this bill. Section 6 sets forth the requirements for the regulations that must be adopted by the director with the approval of the State Board of Prison Commissioners. This is the standard procedure for the Department of Corrections to approve any of their administrative regulations, also known as ARs. Importantly, this section requires that those regulations apply to each institution and facility of the department and that they address the supervision, custody, care, security, housing, and medical and mental health treatment of, of, of these offenders. I'll note that we use the word offenders uh, throughout the Nevada Revised Statutes as well as the, as the administrative regulations. It's simply the term that we use to identify incarcerated people in the state of Nevada. Uh, Section 6 also requires that the generally accepted standards of care and best practices be used, including the use of respectful and up-to-date terminology that accounts for and protects these offenders' rights, and that prohibits discrimination against such offenders. Section 8.3 adds training and cultural competency for interacting with the populations listed in the bill, and a list of items that must be included in any program of facility training for staff. Finally, Section 9 requires that these new regulations be adopted no later than January 1st of 2024, and Section 10 makes the bill effective upon passage and approval. With your permission, Vice Chair Harris, I'd like to turn it over now to Cy um, in Las Vegas to further expand on the need for this bill and the impact that it would have if we were to pass it. Absolutely. Cy, go ahead when you're ready. Please uh, don't forget to state your name for the record as you speak. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Senator Scheibel. Thank you, Senator Harris. Uh, my name is Cy Burnaby, S-Y, last name B-E-R-N-A-B-E-I, and I'm the Executive Director of Gender Justice Nevada. I'm also a proud transgender Nevadan. I have never been in prison, but I am scared to death of being incarcerated because I know that trans people experience a much higher rate of violence just because of their gender identity and expression. I know that I would probably be continually misgendered, harassed, and possibly experience horrendous acts of sexual violence as statistics reflect that. The Federal Bureau of Justice Statistics reports that 35% of trans and intersex inmates have reported sexual assault or abuse just in the past year by either another prisoner or staff, and that's just what has been reported. We know from RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, that out of 1,000 assaults, only 300 are reported. And out of the ones that are reported, only one 
out of six will lead to an arrest. When transgender people experience violence, whether in public or private, we often do not have access to services designed to protect people from harm. Being incarcerated should not mean being subjected to more unnecessary danger just because they are in government custody. In 1994, almost 30 years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on Eighth Amendment grounds that failing to protect trans people in custody is unconstitutional because it qualifies as cruel and unusual punishment. However, sometimes harm is caused intention unintentionally because of lack of knowledge about trans and intersex people when it comes to language, lived experience, and not using trauma-informed approaches. When bias creeps into these spaces and people believe our very identity is invalid, it means they have license to abuse us or disregard <clears throat> uh, reported abuse in the name of morality. Even if you don't understand someone's identity, we can all agree that we are all human. We are all deserving of basic human constitutional rights and that everyone should be tra treated fairly and equally regardless of their social status, race, gender, sexuality, or gender identity. In the last 25 years of doing this work, since the late 90s when I was in college, I have personally worked with hundreds of trans youth and adults who have had negative interactions with law enforcement just because of their gender identity or presentation. I have heard of stories of sexual assault that went unreported for fear of retribution, excessive violence while in detention or placement in solitary confinement, and refusal to allow access to basic health needs and accommodations. These are not special rights or privileges, but again, basic human rights. There is a long and documented history of brutality towards our community that still creates fear and distrust. I remember working with a young trans girl in Los Angeles in the late 90s. She had been abused by both parents and an older sibling and kicked out just because of who she was. She lived on the streets from the age of 12 to 14 and had been arrested for loitering and curfew. She endured endless violence at the hands of other inmates and guards during her three month incarceration. When she was released and put into our care at a group home, she, she attempted suicide twice in the first three months because of the PTSD she experienced and eventually succeeded in ending her life just six months after being released because her reports were not investigated and there was no post-release therapy provided. She was 15 when she ended her life. I want to stress that when LGBTQ plus people attempt and succeed at suicide, it isn't because of who they are, but how society treats us. Her name was Christina, after Christina Aguilera, her hero. She would have been 38 this year. I think about her every day and what amazing things she would be doing in this world had that violence not happened. She wanted to go to college and be a therapist because she wanted to help people who were hurting the way she was. This is something that needs to be addressed and fixed now in society. One of the tenets of making our communities a safer place, and this includes schools, workplaces, and prisons, is educating people in those spaces. The more we understand each other, the more we can create a more supportive space with less incidents of violence and discrimination. One of our main jobs at Gender Justice Nevada is doing just that, diversity and inclusion trainings. Every year, we provide trainings to thousands of teachers, therapists, law enforcement agencies, medical providers, community members, business owners, and more. We also include organizational assessments where we can look at all aspects of an organization or business and provide best practices and tools to create a safer space, not only for the clients or customers, but for the employees as well. Through our evaluation tools, we see that after having been trained, staff are more confident and empowered to work with marginalized communities like those of us that are LGBTQ+. We must create protective environments, address risks, and establish victim-centered and inclusive spaces. Changing policy is indeed a necessary beginning to changing systems for the better. But if staff is not given the tools on how to create that safer environment, then the lawsuits will continue. The people whose lives have been permanently broken by this violence will continue to carry the burden of being victimized by a system that is meant to rehabilitate, rehabilitate rehabilitate them. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, Chair Scheibel, are we going to hear from our guest attorney for the day or would you prefer to have him just available for questions? I think he only intended to be available for questions. Okay, does that conclude your presentation then? 
It does. Thank All you. right, great. Committee members, any questions? Senator Hansen. Many thank you, Madam Vice, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, uh, Lovelock Prison's in my in my district. They're at fifty percent staffing right now. Um, now we're going to provide mental health providers. We can't even get guards. I'm just kind of wondering. Obviously, this will go to fiscal, but I'm just kind of wondering: Is there a pool of people that is out there that we can somehow hire as mental health counselors for the entire Nevada prison system when we can't even get guards? So, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, two things. First of all, um, I did have a conversation with Director Zarenda about hiring more mental health professionals in uh, the Nevada Department of Corrections, and I think he has some really good and creative ideas to recruit people who are willing to work in Nevada prisons. And second of all, this bill doesn't require that we provide any particular um, uh, counselors or staff members or even programming for people who are gender diverse. It requires that the Department of Corrections always, ha here's the thing, it requires that they always have a policy in place. The current director is willing to work with us to create a policy. Um, the purpose of the bill is to ensure that there is always a policy in place at the Department of Corrections that is um, respectful towards people who are gender diverse and ensures that they're going to continue to be treated with respect and dignity. Okay, well, question, next question is, if somebody comes into the prison system and they are biologically male but they identify as female, is that something that's going to stay with them the entire time during their prison sentence, or is that considered something that's fluid and they can at some point shift, you know, go back to being a biological male rather than a female? I mean, how does that work for the, prison, for the, for the people running the prisons? Melanie Scheibel, again, for the record. And what the bill says is that the Department of Corrections has to have a policy that informs guards, that informs other people who are working there about what it means to be transgender and what it means to be non-binary. Um, you could have any number of different cases come through the Department of Corrections. And in fact, there have been any number of different cases of people with varying gender identities. And the, the point of the bill is to ensure that that person is treated with respect and dignity throughout their stay at the Department of Corrections and that they have an avenue to inform the Department of Corrections about um, the, ex the treatment that they're experiencing or the accommodations that they might need. One more. Uh, uh, on the question of rape, okay, uh, we have already had a whole bunch of issues and typically it's been male on male rape uh, where that occurs. If, if a male, like frankly, if I was a prisoner, uh, I would tell them that I was whatever it would take to put me in the female side of the prison system because frankly if I'm going to be stuck there for several years I'd much rather be with women than with men. How do you prevent things like that from happening? Melanie Scheibel for the record and gender is not a test. Um, there is no particular set of questions. It's not, you know, a quiz in Cosmo that people going into the system can enter in order to get assigned to the place where they want to be assigned. Um, the policy is supposed to put in place a process during which the person who's being incarcerated undergoes conversations, evaluations, um, a a, a series of discussions to determine the most appropriate place for them to fit. Um, I think that, sure, it's possible that people would try to, I think what you're referring to is game that system in order to be placed in the wrong housing facility. And I think that the Department of Corrections is smart enough to write a policy that doesn't allow people to do that. I'd also like to, to um, hand this over to Mr. Sens, who has worked on a number of cases involving uh, trans and non-binary people in custody, who I, I think has some experience with these questions. Yeah, I'd love to hear from him, because my concern, obviously, is if we're worried about rape, having biological males in the women's prison would probably expand the amount of rape that would occur on the female side of the prison. Mr. Sens, if, you, uh, if you'd like, we welcome your uh, experience and testimony. Well, uh, thank you very much, and good afternoon. Um, Richard Sainz, um, Liam DeLegal, and I'm... <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm happy to, to address the question posed, but um, before, before going into it, I, I think there is, um, it's important to just understand the context that the Federal Prison Rape Elimination Act already requires that the, that the system take steps to um, do assessments around safety and addressing uh, marginalized communities that 
are already at a higher risk of sexual assault, including transgender people and specifically transgender women who are housed in men's facilities. I think it's inaccurate to state that a transgender woman is a biological male. Um, the science just um, doesn't support that. So if we are talking about the risk of housing a transgender woman in a woman's facility, I, I think um, there, there really isn't a, a factual basis to, to say that um, that's going to increase the risk of rape or um, the risk to, towards uh, other women who are in the women's facility. Um, that being said, um, the state of California in, enacted its SB 132 concerning the housing and treatment of transgender women in its prison system. And um, that has not played, that concern has not played out that um, men will um, pretend or try to game the system um, to be housed in the women's facilities. Um, other states such as um, New York has a bill pending the gender identity respect, um, the, the GERDS Act, Gender Identity Respect, Dignity and Safety Act that also requires um, assessments about the safety of, of the people in the New York um, state prison and county jail systems, looking at the gender identity as well as the safety of, these, uh, of the people that are in its custody. Again, the baseline is the federal law, the Prison Rape Elimination Act. The other baseline is what the Eighth Amendment of the US Constitution requires, that there be an individualized assessment of the known risk and that the system takes steps to, to address it. I think having policies such as the one that's um, proposed by SB 153 is a necessary and, and important step um, to reinforce and, and, and it really also protects staff and um, prison officials of knowing what the law requires and that they are taking these affirmative steps to make sure that they are complying with federal and whatever state laws apply and also protects the, the incarcerated person's rights and that there be a process that they be um, able to in, enforce those rights. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, we could, uh, we could uh, talk extensively more about this. Was, frankly, there is a huge pragmatic and practical application of this that I think is being overlooked. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I could weigh in, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, I'll also point out that we have trans people in custody already. Whether there's a policy or not, the practical and the logistical implications of housing people who are trans doesn't go away. The question is just do we want to address it or do we want to pretend that it doesn't exist and hope for the best? Additional questions? Senator Stone. Thank you, Senator Scheibel. Uh, I share some of the same concerns about our tremendous vacancy in our prison guard uh, uh, within our prisons. Um, you mentioned that you've had some con conversations with Mr. Zarenda. So, um, and he seems to be receptive to some of your concerns. And I'm curious as to why you feel we need to have this in statute when you're getting cooperation from him to address some of these issues. And you mentioned also that everyone deserves to be respected and that through education uh, we can prevent disrespect of trans, et cetera, people. Um, are there anything, is there anything within the existing policies uh, that our prison guards have to comply with that would promote disrespect of anyone irrespective of their uh, sexual status. Melanie Scheibel, for the record, I think that uh, you're going to hear some testimony from people in support of the bill who will do a much better job than I ever could of explaining why it's necessary to put these requirements into statute. Um, directors change um, and statutes, well, here they also change, but the purpose, as I mentioned earlier, is to ensure that there is always a policy in place. And um, right now, like like you mentioned, we, we do have cooperation with the department to develop these policies. That has not always been the case. And um, I hope that will be the case going forward. But I think that um, when you hear the stories of some of the, you know, the 
unfair treatment that trans and non-binary people have experienced in the Nevada Department of Corrections. I hope you'll agree that passing a bill to ensure that a policy is developed and put in place is, you know, kind of the, the least that we can do to ensure their protection moving forward. Um, and as for the current training of staff, um, two things. First of all, absolutely, there's nothing in their training that, you know, encourages uh, discrimination or disrespect or, um, you know, behavior that is hateful. I think that there are some sections of their training that is missing um, to ensure that their that the ethos of respect extends to everybody. And um, we've also heard from members of the community who are LGBTQ, especially trans and non-binary, that they don't feel comfortable in law enforcement settings. You know, I I would love to see um, a correctional facility that actually employs trans people as corrections officers and in, in the reception area and in the administrative offices. And I think that whatever we can do to improve that culture of accept, acceptance and respect, maybe we'll even help with our staffing problem. Thank you. If I can just follow up uh, two more things. Uh, you mentioned training in cultural competency. So uh, who's going to define that and who's going to be delivering that service to us? Melanie Scheibel, for the record, the cultural competency would be defined within um, the regulation that would be set forth, which would have to undergo um, a public review through the Board of Prisons, or depending on how other legislation goes this session, it might be a different kind of you know, review process, but it has to go, the regulation goes through a process of being developed, submitted to um, the Board of Prisoners before it's actually adopted. And so during that process, cultural competency would be more thoroughly defined. Thank you. And can you just educate me on the, on the current practices, and I'll give the example of a trans woman. Do we have trans women today that are bunked with biological females in any of our prison systems here in Nevada today? I would not be the right person to answer that question. Okay, so just as a follow, and here's my concern. My concern is that if you have a trans woman that has not undergone a vaginoplasty, that goes, is groomed, if you will, with a biological female, and I'm, I'm not suggesting the scenario that my colleague was suggesting, I'm just suggesting somebody that has a, a male genitalia that identifies as female rooming with a woman that has biological female characteristics, how they can undress, how they can shower, how they can coexist with one another. Uh, putting the sexual uh, assault issue aside, although it's very important, it's the uncomfortableness of living with somebody uh, that isn't within your sex. Melanie Scheibel, again, for the record, I would suggest that living with somebody in a prison setting is never comfortable, um, and that that is the purpose of developing a policy, is to determine um, what are the guidelines going to be, what kinds of um, assessments are we going to have to do for the facility where we're going to be housing transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary people, um, what are you know the facility's capabilities, and you know to my earlier point, we already have to house these people. Um, and so developing a more comprehensive policy to ensure that we're housing them in a place that is safe for them and safe for other people in the custody of the Department of Corrections, I think is the smart thing to do. So then it wouldn't be route of the realm of possibility. Today we have family restrooms that you can go in there and no matter what your sex is or your identity, you can use that restroom. It, it would not be um, impossible if this were to be passed into law that we could have gender neutral cells that would accommodate people so that we don't see the kind of conflicts that uh, many of us are concerned about. Uh, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, this bill would not change whatever laws are currently in place to allow or disallow gender neutral cells. Um, I'm not aware of any law in place that prevents the Department of Corrections from um, integrating the, the men's and women's sides of the prisons now. Mm -hmm. I think there are very clear reasons why they don't do that. Um, and this bill doesn't change that. Thank you very much. And I don't know, Mr. Sens, if you want to, Sayens, sorry, if, if you want to um, offer a little bit of context as well. Thank you, Senator. Um, I, I do not know of any um, system that has um, created a gender neutral um, uh, facility so that that hasn't um, occurred. Um, I, I, I agree with you that um, having, having clear clearer policies and trainings are uh, a net positive. Again, it goes to not only the, the safety and 
um, protection and um, um, in, informing the incarcerated person of their rights, but also to the staff and prison officials of knowing what are the requirements, um, what, um, what, what trainings and resources are available to them so that they are able to do their jobs. So it's not only to the benefit of the uh, protecting the incarcerated person, but also to to the staff members who would un undergo these trainings. And um, it's 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 good to hear that the director has um, has made efforts to to work um, with you all in um, at at this point. And sir, can you just say your name for the record? Richard Signs for the record. Any additional? Senator Harris. Uh, yes, go ahead, please. Do you mind if I jump in on this one? Um, I'd like to address um, all of those questions, actually. Thank you, Senator Stone and, Stone, and thank you, Senator Hansen, for asking them. They are not uncommon questions. First of all, I want to address what you were stating about housing people who are identifying as female and putting them in men's prisons. There's a very rigorous set of guidelines that is, that is uh, done during the intake process, just like if we were talking about gender affirming health care, those surgeries are not done haphazardly just because somebody wants one. These decisions are made with the individual, with caseworkers, with therapists, and it is seen the same in a prison system. Somebody cannot simply say, I want to be in this prison because it is safer. There is actually a whole process that they would have to go to, and I think that that's what Senator Scheibel is alluding to when she is talking about creating a policy is that's what would happen. It wouldn't just simply happen because somebody says, I want to be in that prison because it's safer. There is, a, again, a whole set of guidelines. And in talking about uh, sexual assault that happens in prisons, there is already sexual assault that happens in women's prisons that's committed by other women. There is sexual assault, sexual assault that happens in men's prisons that happens to other men by men. And what we're talking about is making it safer, making the guards more aware, making them more training them. Um, but just because simply that somebody is put into a prison, it, their genitalia does not matter. These sexual assaults are still happening. So what we're trying to do is create a safer uh, space for everyone. Thank you. And Cy Burnaby, I'm sorry, S-Y-B-E-R-N-A-B-E-I. Thank you. Senator Hansen. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't catch uh, your name. You just mentioned we have a vigorous set of guidelines in place right now to deal with these things. Um, are those federal? And if that's the case, why do we need this bill? Thank you again, Cy Burnaby. Um, no, the policy would create that. The, if somebody, but right now there are trans people in prisons and they aren't just placed there because they say, I want to be in a certain prison. Um, what would happen is on a case-by-case -case basis, if somebody were being incarcerated, they would sit down with a caseworker, they would sit down with people of that staff who would then determine if in fact, you know, the, because I understand what you're saying, that people are trying to gain the system. I, I get what you're saying, but it wouldn't just happen just because somebody would say, oh, I'm a man, now I'm a woman, I feel safer here, this is where I'm going to be placed. Just like with healthcare, we go through a, a set of guidelines to get our insurance to pay for health care. So when it comes to um, where we are going to be housed, it wouldn't just simply be, I am this, this is safer, I'm going to go there. It would, it would be a process, and that's what the policy would create. I got it. Well, thank you. But, yeah, your point is you already have, and your law, lawyer uh, individual also mentioned, there are strict federal guidelines already dealing with these issues. You just mentioned vigorous sets that the policy people are already using to protect transgender people in the, in the prison systems, and those apparently are federal guidelines. So I'm just kind of wondering, is this just a redundancy where we're repeating once again what already exists in federal guidelines, or are we actually expanding this beyond federal policy? If I could jump in, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, um, I think that part of the, the reason for the bill is that the guidelines are not being followed consistently and that we see in different facilities with different PREA coordinators. That's who a person has to meet with when they come through the, the prison system. Um, you know, different PREA coordinators aren't going through the same training or different PREA coordinators or different uh, staff members aren't identifying members of the trans community who need to meet with the PREA coordinator, need to meet with the caseworker. So sometimes 
there probably are people who, who make it through the intake process and they get all of the assessments and all of the evaluations and it's individualized and they are, you know, properly housed with all of the attending resources that they need. And then other times they aren't and they don't. And so the purpose of implementing a policy is so that we have a standard and we can say this person was supposed to meet with this caseworker and this assessment, or maybe it's one person. And this one caseworker was supposed to ask these 10 questions, and did they ask them or did they not? Um, and I think that the, the, poli the policies, the procedures, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're not talking about being the first state or the first um, incarceral system to develop these kinds of guidelines. They would be based on the PREA guidelines. We would probably draw from other states. We would look to people who have gone through the experience being incarcerated about while being trans to develop our best practices all right well we could we could uh, debate this one a little bit more but uh, in the interest of time thank you for the indulgence madam vice chair much appreciated senator hansen uh, any additional questions from members okay with that chair scheibel um if you are good we will open it up for testimony anyone here in carson city to testify in support of senate bill 153 please go ahead and fill the seats don't be shy not talking to anyone in particular all right you will have two minutes and please don't forget to state your name when you begin Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Amber Falco, and I am the Northern Nevada Manager with Battleborn Progress. Today, I am reading testimony on behalf of Daisy, a transgender woman being held at Ely State Prison. I will send the full letter for the record, but the letter reads, I will begin by introducing myself. My name is Daisy Lynn Meadows, and I am a female inmate being housed in a cell with my sister, Amber Renee Meadows. We are being held at Ely State Prison, the most secure and violent facility within the state of Nevada. We both have lawsuits against the state of Nevada for being forced to endure the most extreme and extensive horrors of the male prison environment. We believe that the refusal of NDOC to address our needs as transgender women has made NDOC a party to our abuse. Amber and I have made several requests to be safely and appropriately housed at Florence McClure Women's Correctional Facility or Center. We are not a threat to anyone, especially not to other women. NDOC's willingness to protect us and instead choose to knowingly subject us to sexual abuse, brutal rape, and violence, all occurring at the by the deliberate indifference of staff, our voices, which attempt to bring justice, only result in our own retaliation. The ignorance and attitudes of staff creates an environment that allows transgender people and people identifying as part of the LGBTQ plus community to be harmed. Thank you for the legislation, and we hope that educating those that hold us captive will be a starting point to ensure our safety. Good afternoon, Chair. For the record, my name is Matilda Guerrero, and I'm with Battleborn Progress. Today, I'm reading Deidre's testimony on her behalf. She is a transgender woman who is incarcerated in the Love Luck Correctional Center, and I will send her a full letter for the record, but she writes, being transgender in prison is 100 times more difficult because our existence, our stories, and our voices are constantly being preyed on without any oversight. In prison, there's a saying, you're either predator or you're prey. Folks assume that predators are other inmates, and sometimes they're also correctional officers. Officers. There's no backing up once you come out as transgender in prison. We have never had anyone that was willing to advocate for us until now. It's great to see all the advances made, but the truth is you'll never hear anything that's happening to trans folks in prison. It's hard being trans in prison. Every day I experience many aggressions from other inmates and, and officers. We're constantly reminded about our genitalia and told our experiences are meaningless and we're left voiceless. We have a whole community of transgender incarcerated folks in Lovelock and around the state. We urge you to, urge you to support Senate Bill 153 and, hope to, and help create a community of respect and dignity for trans folk living within NDOC. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jody Hocking, um, J-O-D-I-H-O-C-K-I-N-G, and I'm the founder and executive director of Return Strong an organization that works predominantly with incarcerated people across the state as well as their family members. Um, Chair Scheibel, members of the committee, thank you for bringing this legislation forward. I believe if we are ever gonna see a world that doesn't need to hold human being, 
beings in cages, legislation like this is an important step in setting a standard. I'm sorry, I'm so emotional today. I do not know what my problem is. Um, but legislation like this is an important step in setting the standards for how, as humans, we treat all humans, regardless of race, gender identity, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and conviction history. People in prison deserve the same human dignity that all humans deserve. And this week, the legislature has been really record-making in demanding dignity for incarcerated women and now today bringing legislation that would hold the dignity of incarcerated transgender people into account by creating laws that would ensure that staff are trained and held accountable for the way in which they treat people. Um, I recently heard a statement that there were there are only six transgender people housed in Nevada prisons and I want to make it clear that while there may be six people who are open about their identity there are entire communities of people who identify a multitude of ways at Lovelock at NNCC, at High Desert, at Florence McClure, in each facility in the state. And in order for those people to feel safe enough to be officially open about their identity, we have to create safe spaces. And that starts with staff and the culture of corrections. I talk to those people regularly. They're bullied and ostracized, mocked, and mainly by staff. They're more accepted by other incarcerated people than they are through the, the staff and correction. They repeatedly tell us that while there are risks for them on any yard due to the expression of their gender identity, the culture that allows them comes from staff allowing, encouraging, and participating in the aggressions and microaggressions that occur on a daily basis. And am I done? Ms. you're at two minutes, yes. If you could okay. wrap up, please. Sorry, I'll submit it in writing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. John Pirro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. We'd like to thank Senator Scheibel and the rest of the senators that signed on to this bill for bringing this good piece of legislation forward. Uh, we think that the tone that is set when a person is kept in custody translates when they are released from custody. So it's important that we show respect for the people that we are holding there so that when they come out, they are better off than when they went in. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Harris and members of the committee. My name is Nicole Winkleman, N-I-C-O-L-E-W-I-N-C-K-E-L-M-A-N-N. -N. I am the policy intern at the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence here today in strong support of SB 153. As Cy mentioned in their powerful bill introduction, trans folks experience higher rates of violence and being incarcerated should not mean a sentence for increased violence. The conversation of this bill has unfortunately gotten stuck on sexual assault by trans inmates when this bill is aiming to reduce sexual assaults and violence, including the violence against trans inmates. Looking at sexual assault statistics, majority of sexual assaults are committed by white cisgender men, and the conversation about sexual assaults being committed by our trans inmates is honestly irrelevant, spreading harmful narratives and further fueling transphobia. NCEDSV advocates for the education, prevention, and eradication of violence, regardless of the setting violence takes place in. SB 153 is an important step in the process of creating accountability and ensuring the safety and dignity of transgender and gender non-binary offenders. We urge your support of this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Harris and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Annette Magnus and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We are here today in strong support of Senate Bill 153 and the betterment of the treatment of our trans family who are currently incarcerated. For far too long and far too often, transgender, gender nonconforming, gender nonbinary, and intersex incarcerated persons have been treated with flagrant lack of care for their well-being while in custody of the Nevada Department of Corrections. The NDOC often denies incarcerated gender nonconforming people of their right to medically necessary treatments for gender dysphoria. This is unbelievably cruel and we support this bill to end the inhumane treatment of trans incarcerated people while imprisoned and bring dignity to those folks who have long been denied it. These are human beings treated horrifically while in NDOC custody, and this bill brought by Chair Scheibel will reduce sexual victimization and other harm that is caused to these incarcerated people. I also want to talk brass tacks. It is a huge risk for our state to not have standards on this issue for our, our, our incarcerated folks. 
If we want to talk about liability for NDOC, we have to have rules and consistencies so we always have a policy for our prison staff and how they operate, so they're operating the same way. If we do not get this right, we are putting everyone at risk, and we have seen lawsuits on these issues in other states that have been brought. Thank you to Senator Scheibel and Sai, and to all of the folks who worked hard on this critical piece of legislation. I urge your support. Good afternoon, Vice Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Tess Opferman here on behalf of the Nevada Women's Lobby. Um, we want to thank Senator Scheibel for her hard work on this bill and for the hearing this afternoon. The Nevada Women's Lobby is supportive of this bill and it feels that it is an important safety measure for trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming, and intersex people who are currently in the prison system. Senator Scheibel effectively and clearly explained that we already have trans and non-binary individuals in prison. This is a simple bill to make sure our prisons and prison staff have appropriate policies, regulations, and training to address trans and non-binary populations and ultimately ensure our prison system is safe for these populations as well as for everyone else being held within the correctional system. This is a simple bill that will create a safer space for all individuals. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Marlene Lockard, and I'm representing SEIU 1107. SEIU believes that correctional facilities must adopt regulations that protect the rights and well-being of transgender inmates. This is because transgender individuals are often subjected to discrimination, harassment, and violence in correctional facilities, which can have se severe negative impacts on their mental and physical health. By implementing regulations that ensure transgender inmates are treated with respect and dignity, correctional facilities can help to reduce the harm caused by these experiences. Such regulations might include providing horm hormone therapy and other medically necessary treatments, ensuring that transgender inmates are housed in safe and appropriate facilities, and training staff to understand and respect the needs of transgender individuals. Ultimately, protecting the rights of transgender inmates is not only a matter of basic human decency, but also of ensuring that our correctional system is fair and just for all individuals. I strongly urge all correctional facilities to adopt regulations that protect the rights and well-being of trans transgender inmates and to work towards creating an environment that is safe and inclusive for all. Thank you. Okay, anyone else here in Carson City who'd like to testify in support? All right, if not, we will kick it down to Las Vegas. Anyone in Las Vegas who'd like to testify in support? Just you, Sai. Okay, I think we know how you feel about this one. Great, we'll go to the phones then. BPS, can you uh, please check the phone, see if there's anyone to testify in support of Senate Bill 153? Thank you, Vice Chair. If you would like to offer support of SB 153, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Hello. Go ahead, caller. We can hear you. Hi, this is Sebastian Alcala um, calling in support of the bill. I would just like to say as a formerly incarcerated person, I can attest to the subhuman standard of care received by all inmates as a whole just for being inmates. And so I think that having this uh, care in place will help alleviate some of the trauma that inmates go through just by being incarcerated. Um, I would like to say again, I support this bill for um, you know raising the standard of care for trans and non-binary individuals so they may be better off um, when they get out. Thanks for your time. Sir, can you before you jump off, can you please spell your name for the record? Yeah. 
Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? That. Yes, S A B A S T I A N A L C A L A. Okay, thank you. And we'll take the next caller now, please. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. And please don't forget to say your name and spell it for the record. Perfect, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Haley Lindsley, H A I L E Y L I N D S L E Y, and I urge you to support SB 153 today. Um, transgender incarcerated persons have clearly established constitutional rights with regard to treatment for gender dysphoria. Treatment decisions regarding trans transgender incarcerated persons must be made ba based on individual medical needs, not however the institution sees fit. A facility cannot have a blanket policy that prohibits specific types of, types of treatment, such as an absolute ban on hormone therapy or surgery. And failing to provide appropriate treatments can have serious implications for incarcerated patients' physical and mental health. And denial of these medically necessary health care is cruel and unusual punishment and is in violation of the Eighth Amendment. For these reasons and many more, I urge you all to support SB 153. Thank you for your time today. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. -E -E and I'm the Policy Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada, here in support of Senate Bill 153. The Eighth Amendment to the Constitution prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, and the Supreme Court has upheld that ignoring an incarcerated person's medical needs can violate this prohibition. This is only possible to be upheld when every incarcerated individual, regardless of their gender identity, is able to receive accurate and medically necessary care. According to the American Medical Association, medically necessary services that affirm gender include gender-affirming hormone therapy, gender-affirming surgeries, non-medical social transition, and mental health supports. Although NDOC has made updates to their medical directive, it continues to suggest that at any time they may discontinue or refuse to initiate treatment of hormone therapy during a person's incarceration, regardless of the medical need. These regulations conflict with the prevailing standards of care. Senate Bill 153 is a necessary piece of legislation to ensure NDOC maintains regulations that comport with prevailing standards of care and ensure that all transgender and gender nonconforming incarcerated people in Nevada have access to appropriate medical care. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Erica Roth, E-R-I-C-A-R-O-T-H on behalf of the Washoe County Public Defender's Office, testifying in support of SB 153. First, I want to thank the bill sponsor for bringing this essential legislation. Um, we've heard many stories today of directly impacted people, and I want to add just one more of those stories um, from a client of mine. My client, a trans woman, was charged with battery with a deadly weapon after she successfully fought off her rapist. Um, when she was booked into jail, she was placed in solitary confinement after she was threatened by other inmates. And this was, you know, quote, for her safety as a transgender woman. I saw firsthand how solitary confinement degraded her mental health um, and ultimately forced her into a misdemeanor plea negotiation despite having a strong case because she had to make a decision that her mental health at the time was the most important determination and not her innocence. I also want to say that when I was working to get her out of solitary confinement, I had a lot of conversations with very empathetic deputies who did not have ill will, but simply did not have the tools or training to adequately serve this population. And this gets to the reality that transgender people are already in our criminal legal system. Providing training to these deputies and officers um, is necessary to ensure that transgender people who have found themselves in the criminal legal system are treated with dignity and respect. Our transgender friends, neighbors, family members, and partners deserve to live with that dignity and respect regardless of their involvement with the criminal legal system, and this bill is a first step in that direction. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, this is Barry Cole, B-A-R-R-Y-C-O-L-E. I've been a psychiatrist in Nevada for about four decades, and I'm in support of SB 153 because of its emphasis on mental health treatment of offenders with transgender, gender nonconforming, gender nonbinary, and intersex issues. I would like to just also add as a comment, yesterday, Director Zarenda testified regarding AB 292, uh, which is called the Dignity of Incarcerated Women's Act, and explained that as part of the pre-admission or admission assessment for housing in our prison system, that there's a medical examination and the determination about where someone winds up, male or female prison, is based on 51 percent, meaning that the preponderance of sexual characteristics must be biological and not psychological. So it didn't appear his testimony said people are simply picking women's prisons as safer housing units than male prisons. This bill is philosophical. It talks about standards of care, best practices, respect, and certainly uh, pro prohibits discrimination, and of course provides cultural competency training. This is now running through mental health in general in Nevada, so all mental health practitioners in Nevada are required to obtain uh, cultural competency training, and the Nevada Psychiatric Association took it so seriously, we just provided eight hours of such training in Las Vegas in February. So I applaud the sponsors for bringing SB 153, and I certainly encourage its passage. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Brianna Escamilla, B-R-I-A-N-A-E-S-C-A-M-I-L-L-A, -L -L -A, for the record. And I'm here on behalf of Planned Parenthood Votes Nevada in support of SB 153 because we believe that all people deserve access to the medical and mental health care that they need. The NDOC's current policies fail to recognize that incarcerated people who are transgender or gender nonconforming have a right under current case law and the Eighth Amendment to medically necessary treatments for gender dysphoria. Failing to provide appropriate treatments can have serious implications for incarcerated patients' physical and mental health. Senate Bill 153 simply requires the NDOC to adopt regulations that align with medical best practices and the current state of the law. We urge you to support SB 153. Thank you for your time. Hi there, my name is Ella Bassett, E-L-L-A-B-A-S-S-E-T-T. -S -S -E I'm calling in support of SB 153 because uh, I am a trans woman, um, and I think it's important to understand what, as a trans person, dysphoria can do to you. So I came out, at, like I've known I was trans for over a decade, didn't come out until last year. The most important things are that knowing that information deteriorated my own mental health into constant suicidal thoughts, anxiety, um, rabid depression, um, you name it. And that sadness blocked a lot of my own ability to live my life and move, like, progress it forward. And I knew this for over a decade. And after now receiving the best medical practices for gender dysphoria, I'm happy to exist. I don't see suicidal thoughts anymore. My depression comes maybe once in a blue moon. And I think it's really important that we get people the best, mes the best medical best practices, even if they are offenders. So thank you for the time and have a great day.
Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Jessica Munger, M-U-N-G-E-R. I'm the Program Manager of Silver State Equality, Nevada Statewide LGBTQ Plus Civil Rights Organization. We are in support of SB 153 and the proper treatment of incarcerated trans and gender diverse people. Thank you to the Chair and Committee. We encourage your support. You have recently joined us and would like to offer testimony in support of SB 153. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Calvin Bird. I'm the founder of Uncloak, which is the suicide and isolation prevention to trans men. And I just wanted to say ditto in support of the bill. Thank you. Yes, hello, my name is Justin Time and I am calling in support of this bill. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Sarah. There are no other callers wishing to offer a testimony in support of SB 153 at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will turn to testimony in opposition. Is there anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 153? Okay, not seeing anyone. We will go down to Las Vegas. Is there anyone in Las Vegas uh, who wants to come forward and testify in opposition to Senate Bill 153? All right, broadcast, can you please check the phones? Oh, I think maybe we got a glimpse of a different room for a minute. Um, BPS, can you please check the phones, see if there's anyone who'd like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 153? Thank you, Vice Chair. If you would like to offer testimony in opposition to SB 153, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Katie Benuelos. I'm here representing the Libertarian Party of Nevada. That's Benuelos, B-A-N-U-E-L-O-S. We object to SB 153 because it does not clearly prohibit biological men from being housed in women's prisons. This bill would require that trans transgender prisoners be housed according to generally accepted best practices, which is entirely too vague. Decisions about how to house violent criminals must be made with physical safety as the top priority. Lawmakers must not leave the door open to gender identity self-ID being used as the basis for prisoner housing. It has been acknowledged that sexual predators will game any system, take advantage of any opportunity to access victims. People who are psychologically capable of violent rape will not draw the line at lying about their gender identity. And prison officials should not be put in the position of trying to evaluate their sincerity. We respectfully request that this bill be amended to clearly specify that biological men may not be housed in women's facilities and vice versa. Advocates for this bill argue that it's unsafe for trans-identified prisoners to be housed in accordance with their biological sex. I'm sure that's true for the same reasons that it's dangerous to allow self-ID. It's perfectly reasonable to make accommodations to protect the physical safety of prisoners who may be at higher risk of violent assault but those accommodations should not include an option for transfer to facilities intended for the opposite sex. Any legislation on this issue needs to be absolutely clear in its terms. There is a reason that separate facilities for men and women exist to begin with. This is a situation where biology and anatomy matter more than subjective gender identity. No person with a penis should be incarcerated with women and the law should reflect that. Thank you for your time.
Good afternoon, Vice Chair Harris and committee. My name is Jim DeGraffenried, D-E-G-R-A-F-F-E-N-R-E-I-D, and I'm Nevada's Republican National Committee man representing the Nevada Republican Party. We'd like to express our concerns in opposition to Senate Bill 153. This bill is an attempt to deny reality because science doesn't allow you to actually change your gender no matter what surgery you have. Regardless, individuals can usually identify and present as whatever gender they choose without a problem, but there are places such as the military, sports, and prisons where doing so may infringe on others' rights and in some cases is actually dangerous. This bill puts staff and gender-conforming prisoners in danger and opens up the state of Nevada for litigation risk on a number of fronts. First, in states where transgender inmates have been housed with inmates of the same gender identification, sexual assaults and harassment are rampant as seen in practice in New Jersey prisons. Consider the transgender Rikers inmate in New York who received seven years for raping a female inmate while he was housed in the women's jail. Or the example of California, which allows male sex offenders to transfer to women's prisons with predictable outcomes, including HIV outbreaks due to sexual assault. Second, our prisons have serious problems already that are unresolved. See the example of the escaped Luxor bomber who was on the run for four days before the state even noticed he was gone. Perhaps instead of focusing on pronouns, our prison system should be focused on keeping convicted felons incarcerated. Rather than focusing on cultural competency training as described in Section 8 of the bill, let's focus on keeping criminals locked up. Third, we already have a shortage of prison guards and difficulties recruiting. How much harder will it be to recruit and retain qualified correctional officers when they have to worry about a prisoner suddenly deciding to change their pronouns? How many lawsuits will be filed against hardworking correctional officers and this gender of prisoner? Why is there more concern about how an inmate chooses to identify than about the officers who put their lives on the line every day to keep dangerous felons off Nevada streets? Transgender felons can easily protect themselves in prison simply by identifying as their actual biological gender while incarcerated without endangering the majority of other prisoners and staff. We strongly urge that this committee protect the vast majority of felons, correctional officers, and Nevada citizens and oppose this dangerous bill. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. There are no other callers wishing to offer opposition to SB 153 at this time. Okay, anyone here in Carson City looking to give neutral testimony on Senate Bill 153? Welcome. Uh, my name is Kirk Widmar, W-I-D-M-A-R. I'm the Chief of the Offender Management Division for the Nevada Department of Corrections. Uh, we thank you, uh, Vice Chair and, and Senator Scheibel, for bringing uh, this bill forward. Um, in looking at the language in the bill, uh, we have a testifying in the neutral stance. There are, uh, since 2013, the Department of Corrections has complied explicitly with the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which covers m many of the topics, if not all, that are here in the bill. Um, there is an audit process that requires the, all facilities within the department to be audited um, every three years. So every year there are audits being conducted by the Department of Justice trained certified auditors. And I'm happy to report that the department has been 100% compliance in its final report uh, with each of those audits. Um, the codification of this into state law, um, I believe will support the continued efforts of the department's compliance with the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Lieutenant Benu Clark, uh, I'm the uh, lieutenant in charge of the Employee Development Man Employee Development Division. Excuse me. Um, we have and will continue to provide training and cultural competency for all of offenders, not just those who are LGBTI or gender nonconforming. Uh, part of our uh, PREA training is that over the last year we went through and did in-person training. Uh, for every staff member in the department. Uh, that training includes uh, topics such as SOGI, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, as well as how to communicate effectively with all offenders, including those who are LGBTI. Uh, we will continue to uh, 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 adopt these programs as appropriate. Uh, we have also adopted a policy where we refer to all offenders uh, in general neutral terms uh, basically what that means is that uh, we refer to all offenders either as offender smith for example or just smith uh, we've uh, tried to get rid of all the uh, pronouns to avoid any confusion and avoid any uh, intentional or unintentional misgendering of any offender okay thank you i will allow you to ask one question senator hansen isn't that generous of you? Thanks. We're just talking about the entire 
public prison system, so I'll get one in. Question is, what you just said was, as since 2013, you guys already are doing all the stuff that's in this bill and all this is going to do in effect is reinforce the vigorous set of guidelines, as the other in individual mentioned, that you're already doing. Is there anything in this bill at all that actually is not what you're currently doing? Kirk Widmar, for the record, Senator Harris, thank you for your uh, your question. Hanson, no matter. Hanson, I'm she, sorry. She's going to get sorry, mad at that sorry, one. Sorry, sorry, I apologize. Um, the the prison rape elimination standards consist of 43 standards and some 250 subsections that require 100% compliance each year we go through audit. I believe that everything, the definitions found in the section, uh, the in section six as well as section eight. Um, I believe are all sections that are covered within the, the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards. Um, Perfect. Right. That's, that, that's the answer right there. Thank you. You guys are already doing all this stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else for neutral testimony here in Carson City? Not seeing anyone jumping up. We'll go down to Las Vegas. And a quick visual check. No one there to testify in the neutral either. BPS, could you please check the phones one last time? Thank you, Vice Chair. To provide neutral testimony to SB 153, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers wishing to offer neutral testimony at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll invite the sponsor back up if you'd like to make any closing comments, Chair. Thank you. I would just briefly like to thank the committee for your engagement on this bill and uh, point out a couple of things. Uh, the first one being that um, as an attorney, I think it's really important that when we are trying to establish some kind of standard that we put that standard in writing. And that is part of the purpose of bringing a bill to develop a regulation, even if it is redundant with some of the PREA requirements. Um, PREA is a federal requirement. Uh, it doesn't provide protections in state court. And I think that every person who is incarcerated in the Department of Corrections in the state of Nevada should be able to refer to a state law, a state policy that describes the way that they are entitled to be treated under law while they are incarcerated. So even if the words are exactly the same, we do that often in Nevada statutes. We have statutes that mirror federal statutes so that, or regulations that mirror a federal law, or a regulation that mirrors a federal statute, or a statute that mirrors a federal regulation. Sometimes we are repetitive in order to ensure that people have protections at both the state and the federal level. I also would be remiss if I did not thank profusely the ACLU of Nevada for their help with this bill. Our presenter from the ACLU is sick today, so she did not join our presentation, but uh, they have been working with me on this bill for uh, you know, many years now. And uh, the reason I was reminded of that was because there is the legal aspect of this requirement. And the ACLU has sued uh, Departments of Corrections, not the ACLU of Nevada, but the broader ACLU and ACLUs of other states have sued Departments of Corrections in other states for failing to provide adequate protections and care for transgender and gender nonconforming individuals in their care. And I don't want Nevada on that list. Um, I'm not interested in suing the state of Nevada or the Nevada Department of Corrections for the way that it treats gender nonconforming and gender nonbinary people. Um, I'm interested in working proactively to ensure that we have a policy in place that prevents mistreatment and ensures that we're all on the same page, uh, treating people with dignity, treating people with respect, protecting their rights, protecting their freedoms, protecting their liberties, even while they are incarcerated. Because even though people might be convicted of a crime and incarcerated in the Nevada Department of Corrections, our powers as the state are limited. We can take things away like people's freedom, we can take away their property, we can control who they're allowed to talk to and who they're not, we can control when they go on the yard and when they don't, but one thing that none of us has the right to do is to tell somebody who they are. And so that is the purpose of this bill, is to allow people to tell us who they are. And with that, I thank you, uh, Vice Chair Harris and the rest of the committee. Thank you so much, Chair Scheibel. With that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 153, and I will hand the gavel back over to its rightful owner.
All right. That brings us to uh, the last item on our agenda for today, which is public comment. Anybody wishing to give public comment, as a reminder, you'll have two minutes to speak, and this is to be unrelated to SB 153, um, just anything else within the purview of the Judiciary Committee. I'm not seeing anybody coming to the table in Carson City or Las Vegas, so we will go to the phones for public comment. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to offer public comment today, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers wishing to offer public comment at this time. All right, then that brings us to the conclusion of our meeting for today. Tomorrow we will be meeting in a joint session with the Senate Education Committee upstairs in one of the larger rooms on the third floor. And that meeting will be at 1 p.m. Until that time, we are adjourned. <laughs>